Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Dennis Moeller, uh, and so today I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of how to do backwards design using a uh, either end of the course or mid course assessment. And so this is for the Cristo Rey Network, U.S. History, um, mid course assessment. Um, so the first really big thing to uh, bear in mind when planning out um, kind of a unit or a semester um, is really to kind of flip the idea. Usually we think about, okay, well, I will test them on what I teach. But this is kind of asking you to think about, well, what am I going to test them on? And then I have to teach that. And so um, when we talk about this, this is the idea of like standards based education, that it's skill based, that we're looking at what can students do and not do at any particular time. Um, we're going to decide as instructors, what do they need to be able to do by a certain time? And then how do you scaffold people, your students to get there? Um, and so if we look at the CR network uh, interim assessment, I guess this would be like the midterm assessment. Um, it's set within the era of the Civil War and Reconstruction, and it asks the students to do an awful lot. So if we read this question, it says in this document based question, you will compose a well organized essay that includes yada, 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 using evidence from at least four documents, relevant facts, examples, details, counter argument, making connections. Um, it's a pretty complicated question with a lot of different pieces to it. Um, and so as I look at this, I'm, this is not day one stuff, at least for the students who I teach. And so I look at this and ask, okay, what are all the pieces of this? What is it asking them to do? And so I break down the question into this idea that, well, they need to know some stuff. They have to know about the Civil War, Reconstruction, um, but also a lot of this question asks them to gather and judge multiple sources, you know, successes and limitations, things like that. Um, and then it also asks you to draw a conclusion based on evidence. The idea of it being the second American Revolution, well, that's going to be a thesis. Do you have enough evidence to prove that this is can be put up as like a second American Revolution, that everything about the country is pretty much changing? Um, so then you kind of look at the guidelines. Um, and again, I always like to break it down into kind of what are the tasks we're asking them to do. And so uh, kind of using those three ideas, you know, kind of content, you know, evidence and conclusions, I'm able to actually break down the question into a way that might be easier to explain to the students. Um, and so the first step in doing this after just kind of looking at the question is to take the test and to take it remembering that at this stage in our lives and our careers, so many things just come natural to us. When we read something, we can immediately tell is it primary or secondary. When we look at a chart, we can usually immediately tell what it's trying to say. Um, but when you take your assessment, you have to do it very intentionally from the assumption of, the, of just people who would not naturally just think this way. And so things I have to consider is like how would students react to the words I use, how the question is phrased. And that's actually sometimes the hardest thing um, is just to phrase a question in the way the students will understand it. Um, secondly, you got to think about, well, what content knowledge um, a student's going to need? As teachers of history and social studies, we know a lot of things. Um, but what would the students have to know in order to make sense of each of these sources? Um, then it's usually good to look at which sources are going to be the most confusing because you know that you might have to extra kind of provide extra scaffolding for them to be able to do something that difficult. Um, and then finally, just kind of what basic skills are the students going to require in order to talk about each of these sources. And so going through this, um, I always really like to kind of start from the position that content and context does matter. Um, history matters. And so starting from the assumption of just what do the students need to know, um, this helps us figure out well, what facts are the most important. And so to answer this question about the second American Revolution during Reconstruction, um, they would have to know about the radical Republicans and the Redeemer Democrats. A lot of the sources don't make any sense without them. Um, if they don't know anything about slavery prior to 1865 or citizenship after the Civil War, um, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, the Ku Klux Klan, or the American Revolution itself, it's going to be impossible for them to take these sources and put them in any sort of um, kind of context. And so that's a really great way then to think about, well, what content historical do I need to teach in order to allow them to do this skill? So then I look at the question, I kind of try to break down a little bit. What are you roughly going to need to be able to do? Well, you're going to have to write a thesis based essay. It's a basic ELA concept, hopefully reinforced uh, in a lot of other places. 
but they're also going to have to be able to differentiate between primary and secondary sources. Not always the easiest thing to do if you don't have practice. Um, they need to be able to read primary sources and put those perspectives in a, in a historical context. Again, a very hard thing to do. Um, this also asks them to glean a lot of evidence off of images. And so um, that's something kind of image detail that maybe is not an innate skill. It's something that actually needs to be taught and scaffolded. Um, chronological awareness, um, looking for gaps in sources, all of these things um, are skills that you would have to have in order to be successful in this test. Um, so first thing I do is I'm going to read through the sources. I notice immediately document A and B that one's a primary and one's a secondary. And so I know that it's going to be very, very important to teach my students how to tell the difference between the two, to look at who the author is, to look at the published date, to look at what it's talking about, and also how to use each of these sources. And so um, that's kind of something that if I do not teach them before this day, how can I expect them to just do it, to just know and look to differentiate the two? Um, also, image analysis. If you look at these images uh, without any sort of kind of practice or scaffolding, um, it seems kind of basic. But if you can teach people to look at layers of detail, then all of a sudden these images become a lot more important. You can notice that within the classroom, um, there's a huge age range implying kind of the importance um, of education across the board as trying to uplift recently enslaved persons. Um, in the voting line. You can see that there's all sorts of people dressed in different ways, implying different wealth, different ages, um, as well as soldiers. And so all of these things are things that you can extrapolate an awful lot of meaning from, but a student who's never had practice with image analysis might miss all of that and then miss kind of the point of these pieces of evidence entirely. Um, there's also this thing where in a lot of secondary sources, there's this assumption of knowledge that sometimes isn't there. Um, when Eric Foner, um, or, or, or sorry, this one is uh, Henry Louis Gates, is talking about how you know Reconstruction was too short to ensure a successful transition, um, this implies that you know how Reconstruction ended and why it ended and what came after. That's a lot of that's a lot of what ifs. And so looking at redeemed South. If the students don't know what that means, then this source all of a sudden is confusing, it doesn't make any sense, and they're not going to be able to use it well. And so you have to kind of deal with this idea that a lot of secondary sources are going to assume knowledge. And so you've got to make sure you fill in those gaps if you're going to give students a difficult secondary source to use. Um, so then I just kind of ask, like, will students even understand the question? Um, have students written summaries of complex readings before and ask them to do that in this? They've never practiced it. How can you expect them to do it? Um, do students know uh, the major events, developments, or processes of reconstruction? Um, would students even know what a thesis is or how to make an argument? Um, you also have to decide, like, what does analysis look like for you? Um, do you have an analysis template? Do you have a certain way that you want them to write about evidence or introduce it or talk about it? And so setting expectations uh, beforehand and just practicing the same ones again and again means that your students are going to do what you want them to do. Um, also, too, I'm a really big fan of this, um, kind of stopping the idea of quote dumping. That analysis is going to mean you have to explain the quote, introduce it, or are the students just, you know, copying and pasting in um, a quote for the point of quote dumping to fulfill the requirement? Um, if you aren't specific about what analysis of a quote or piece of evidence is, then students may just feel comfortable just writing the quote and moving on from it. So it's really important to communicate your expectations very clearly. Um, and then just kind of lastly, when we're asking for a complex understanding, um, have you engaged in historical arguments before? Um, have you talked about, you know, the debate over the American Revolution or things like that? Because if we're looking at multiple perspectives, but we never give the students that practice, it's going to be hard for them to kind of think critically about various um, takes on the same idea. So at a bare minimum, for a student to pass, I'm going to need them to be able to write me an MLA-style essay, read higher-level texts, and provide proper MLA citations. Uh, as far as social studies, they need to know a lot of history to get this right. They need to be able to differentiate sources and also decide how reliable and how important sources are. 
um, judging primary sources, judging secondary sources, drawing historical conclusions, and the hardest part, resisting the urge to oversimplify. It's very easy to say, well, it was this way, but we as historians always know that it's never only one way. And so that's an awful lot that you're asking your students to do in this assessment. And so my advice is somewhere along the way, you gotta find a way to teach them how. And so my advice is that you don't have to sacrifice content in order to do this. History is important, it's important to teach, but how you teach it can build up these skills and is gonna eventually end up more important than the what you teach them. For instance, I really want my students to be able to read these labels along with this law and compare these things. But really what I am trying to prepare them for is a future in which they may have to look at food labels for themselves or read a law and a lease and figure out you know, if their landlord is screwing them. It's that idea that these crucial social studies skills, uh, we practice them in history, they have practical applications. Um, and so for instance, if you want to practice primary sources, um, compare a textbook paragraph on Valley Forge to Washington's letters or a soldier's letter home or something like that. Uh, you can use the artwork of Archibald Motley to talk about the 1920s and like the aesthetics of it and the jazz age. Um, you could even look at, in terms of multiple perspectives, the slavery debate in America. What were the arguments in favor of it? What were the ones that were against it? And that could actually give them an awful lot of context in order to both one, have the skill as well as the history knowledge to complete this assessment. Um, and then another big thing that I'm a fan of is assigning skill drills. Either They can either be based on what you're studying in history or not, but that they target specific skills in a measurable way that you can tell today what they don't know so you can teach it tomorrow. And so examples of this would be have them write a thesis on anything and support it with three arguments. Um, that way you can tell very quickly how they're thinking rightly, but also maybe how they're thinking wrongly about thesis. Um, you can practice with political cartoons and photos um, over and over again until they get used to analyzing them. Um, supplementing any textbook that you have with primary sources is always a great practice um, in order to kind of bring in that idea of you know, critical analysis. What did people believe at the time? Um, you can also intentionally, I have a lot of fun doing this, giving them two pieces of evidence that contradict each other. And then making them really read through them and decide which one of these is more reliable or is neither of them reliable at all. Uh, and then finally, um, a good practice is to try a couple college level readings that are done kind of as a we do. Kind of, you know, if I, was in, if I was in school taking this class, reading this reading, here's how I would annotate, here's how I would pull out information. Because ultimately, that's what you're going to ask them to do, and you're going to grade them on it. And so the more you practice with them on the specific skill, the easier it's going to become for them to do it. Um, also, too, short quizzes are a huge thing. By short, um, sometimes they are only three questions uh, in my class. Um, it's always stimulus-based. Um, if you are having them kind of memorize facts, that can be important, but that's not really what we're doing here. Um, and so what we're doing here is reading Wealth by Andrew Carnegie and then having to analyze this primary source. Um, and so you should really have every question should have some type of standard attached to it. Otherwise, ask yourself, is this question really that important if it's not linked to something that I need them to be able to do? Um, also, I like the idea of making really good wrong answers that expose bad thinking processes. Either something where you think they're going to misinterpret it, or you know if they didn't pay close attention to detail. And so the less you have like gotcha questions, the more you can actually see how their thinking is going wrong. Um, and so that's kind of a powerful thing to use quizzes as kind of a short test to just see what can't they do today that I need to teach them tomorrow. Um, and then really my advice is just practice, 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 practice. Um, this is something that um, I started on not too many years ago, this type of standards-based assessment. And so it's been a learning curve. Um, it's taken a lot of time to learn how to write good questions, how to make good assignments. But the more I practice, the more my students can practice. And so, um, you know, in terms of this, we had a practice DBQ that was very similar to the eventual test that was just practice. And we had one for almost every unit. And so 
Also, you can build like skill drills. Um, I build a bank of skill drills based on current events. Um, I'll take a map or I'll take a graph, some article out of the newspaper um, or something like that, and I will simply design questions around it. Um, this also helps students break out of the mold that this is only for history. And it gets them to think that, wait, no, these are skills and standards for life, not just for this class. Um, and so just to kind of wrap up, remember that the skill is really the long-term focus of the class. Most of my students won't remember the compromise of 1820 um, when they're 25, but I hope that they're able to look at a map of the United States with demographic information on it and draw conclusions. I hope they're able to read the newspaper and think for themselves. And so in a lot of ways, um, kind of shifting the focus from getting through the content, instead it is the skill. It is the what you can do that is the long-term goal at the end of the year. Um, and so as a teacher, if I want my students to ace the test, I have to plan the activities that are going to put them in a position to be successful. I would never send a football or rugby team out onto the field without having a lot of practice. And so you can't send your students out on the field without giving them that same practice. And so I plan document-based question style activities in every unit. We work on them together. We hone these skills and we practice them. And then the hope is that after unit one of United States history, they will practice the skill once. And after unit two, they'll practice it more and more. Um, and so my first unit, the colonization and founding, um, I focus a lot on primary versus secondary source comparison. Um, you know, an encyclopedia page or something out of, you know, a history book versus the letters that people were writing at the time about why colonization was happening. And it really kind of helps right off the bat to make the expectations clear. This is what I expect you will be able to do once we practice it enough together. Um, then you can even fold it out even further. Um, in my first unit, were the colonies justified in declaring independence? Well, that brings in primary sources, thesis-based arguments, differing perspectives, complexity, context. And so I try to plan everything I'm doing now for what I want them to be able to do at the end of the semester. If I want them to do image analysis, well, we have to do paintings and political cartoons because I can't expect them to do that if we've never practiced it. And so I do the same thing for every single unit. There's nothing extra, there's nothing different. I just refocus the assignments, I refocus the way that we deal with content to be more geared towards their doing history, as opposed to just kind of learning passively about history. And so the ultimate goal of this is that through enough practice, our students are gonna reach some type of mastery in these skills that we've come to take for granted. So in conclusion, folks, four-step process. First, you gotta have a destination. Where do you want your students to be able to be in a week, a month, a year? And then from there, you have to survey them. What will they need to learn to reach your destination? Where are they today? And what are you gonna have to do to get them there? And so that's your roadmap. How do you make sure that you take your students from where they are today and get them to where you want? And then as you go through this, constant assessment and constant repetition is going to be great. As you check in again and again on these skills, you can refocus class, refocus practice in order to really address those things that they need. So I hope this was somewhat helpful um, in just kind of maybe thinking differently about standards-based education. But remember, we don't sacrifice content for skills, we use the skills in order to teach the content.